Okay, hello. Um, I am Melissa Rogers. I am here to represent the Maryland Delaware Climate Change Education Assessment and Research Program. Made clear as a five year NSF uh, collaborative agreement, also a member of the CCEP Alliance, as um, many of the speakers today, both this morning and this afternoon, are. And um, also, like other people who are presenting today, parts of Made Clear or Made Clear has been recently recognized in the new White House Climate Education and Literacy Initiative. The two particular initiatives of, of Made Clear that were mentioned there in that report involve our work with pre-service teachers. And uh, Dana Verone is in the room and had a poster on that yesterday. And if you want more information, I'm sure you can track her down over the course of the week. And I will be uh, presenting at the end of my uh, talk today about um, our plan to develop master educators. How am I? Oh, there we go. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are part of the CCEP Alliance, and I will be speaking today about just one component of our project, which is our uh, K-12 formal education initiatives, but part of a larger project that also involves informal science education, work with faculty members and pre-service teachers on our partner campuses, and like all of the other CCEP Alliance uh, programs, we also have a group of learning sciences who are focused in particular in our case on the K-12 uh, side of our program. So I'll be talking today about a, uh, our work to date with in-service educators, and in particular with classroom teachers, and even more particular, mostly with middle school teachers. Um, our work is geared towards improving their climate change content knowledge, and also modeling interwoven aspects of the next generation science standards. Um, we are testing several professional development models, and I will briefly address those and our thoughts on scale up within and beyond um, the two states. So the next generation science standards is um, the climate, and the pun is somewhat intended there, um, in which we are working. Um, the next generation science standards are new, and um, despite the map here, which actually isn't complete, um, I just saw a news release yesterday that West Virginia should be colored in, in blue as well. Um, so despite the limited adoption so far across the country, um, NGSS is really quite big, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a really concerning matter to those districts who have adopted it because there is the need for a change from what in many ways for so long in, um, in too many classrooms has been a rote memorization of um, strictly content knowledge. NGSS is calling for what they refer to as an interwoven um, classroom approach which has students actually doing science uh, rather than just learning the content. And so the three, um, three disciplines or three uh, dimensions that NGSS refers to are shown on the left-hand uh, graphic there, which is the content, science and engineering practices, and then also working under the auspices of overarching um, cross-cutting concepts such as systems and models and things like that. Sorry, I keep losing that advance button. So we're working in these two different states. Uh, because we're here at AGU, I figured I'd pull out a USGS map of uh, the physiographic provinces of the two states to show that we are um, working in an area that is taking us all the way from the coastal plain of the Atlantic up through the Appalachians in the far western uh, part of Maryland. And um, there are a lot of differences between these two states and a lot of commonalities. And they really serve together as a model politically and economically of the larger uh, the country itself. But the two um, issues that most impact us in the K-12 side of the program are the differences in the education systems in the two states. Delaware science education is centralized through a formalized partnership between the districts in the state and the um, and the, uh, the Department of Education, and that is through or covers both approval and distribution of curricular materials and professional development of teachers statewide, whereas Maryland is a local control state, so curricular decisions are done on a, a district by district level. 
The approach that we have uh, taken over the last two years through two, uh, actually one and a half um, so far, cohorts of uh, teachers is to develop a climate science academy which has involved a week-long residential summer program and then a series of follow-up sessions throughout the school year which are a combination of in-person um, Saturday afternoon or Saturday all day sessions and evening webinars or virtual sessions as we have been referring to them. The Climate Science Academy is an entire package. When teachers apply to it, they are applying for that entire thing, not just for the summer, and then they can do the follow-ups. Although when it comes to the follow-ups, we do have um, you know, situations where teachers are just not able to attend for one reason or another. We have had 59 educators to date um, in the academies representing 21 districts out of 40 combined in the two states. And we have also had a small number of informal educators who have participated in the academy. And these are largely informal educators who are working with, um, with schools, either on school visits to their institutions or when they go out to, um, to schools to provide programs. Our team of learning scientists, as I mentioned, um, have been involved mostly on the K-12 side of our project and they are doing some, uh, some very detailed but small scale um, case studies of some of the teachers who have implemented climate education in their classroom. One aspect of, Made, of the Made Clear project is that we were not tasked to develop curricular products, so we had to make some decisions on what sort of project or products we would use in the academies. And our approach on that has evolved over the, the two years so far in that what we are currently doing is providing an outline or framework of the topics that um, are considered key in our, um, in our minds, but it's a little more um, involved than us just you know, picking out some topics that are of interest, um, but some key topics and then modeling activities that are um, representative of the types of things teachers would be doing in the classroom with their students or have their students do in the classroom. Um, when I say we didn't just kind of pick these topics out of, out of the air, we used, of course, the NGSS standards as our guidance there, and then our learning sciences team is developing a, um, a learning progression or doing research on developing a learning progression to see what knowledge students are typically coming into the classroom um, with at the lower middle school level and they are focusing right now on just the, um, the build, build up of knowledge over the course of middle school and potentially will be looking forward into um, to high school as well. Now if you take a look at the pictures that are on this particular um, slide just for a minute before I change it, I would say don't be deceived by the pictures that were on the previous slide which apparently some of our um, educators who applied were very strongly influenced by them. Some of them applied to the academy thinking that they were going to get a, an extensive outdoor experience and were somewhat disappointed um, to find that um, a lot of the classroom, classroom work that's associated with climate change content and climate change practices um, is actually indoor, lab-based, pencil and paper, or data heavy. And, um, and so this is something that, that we have um, had to work with a little bit, and we're actually working with some of our informal education partners to, um, to try to put together um, good outdoor class, outdoor experiences that are appropriate for middle school and high school students that have a strong climate change related message to them. Other concerns that our evaluation team has um, looked into or is in the process of looking into, two of the big things are uh, retention over the course of our virtual sessions and then also actual implementation of uh, climate change lessons within the classroom from, by those teachers who have participated in the academy. For, um, if we combine our first cohort who had six follow-up sessions over the course of the 13-14 school year and the three follow-up sessions that we have had so far with um, our second cohort, we have participation rates in the 30 to 60 percent range. Um, some of these have been weather driven. Um, but really what we have seen is that our in-person sessions are more heavily attended than our evening virtual sessions. 
although our virtual sessions for those who attend, um, we have made our best efforts to make them interactive and um, those who participate actually really value what they get out of them. As far as implementation is concerned, for our first cohort, our final follow-up session last earlier this year was on May 14th, and at that point, 86% of them had either implemented something in the classroom or intended to by the end of the school year. Um, and um, so far this year, we know that at least um, 75 to 80% of the teachers have implemented something already within, um, within their classroom. Some of the barriers, uh, probably the two biggest barriers that have been faced as far as implementation is concerned, those of you who live on the East Coast know that last winter was absolutely horrible when it came to snow days and a lot of teachers lost time and therefore were not able to um, pull in something that they considered new to their classroom. And another barrier that has been faced is um, administrative support. And so we have um, in our application process now, we are looking for a letter of support from administrators. Just a couple other words about NGSS, as I'm getting a little short on time. But um, the Made Clear project was started with a recognition that NGSS was coming down the pike, and it was something that, with the increased content as far as climate change was concerned in it, and the um, interwoven approach to the um, to classroom learning, we thought um, that it would be a very strong selling point as far as recruitment is concerned. Um, we have realized that we're actually ahead of the eight ball at this point as far as implementation in the classroom. And we're starting to have some quiet discussions to, to, um, to decide whether NGSS is something that we really want to use as a marketing uh, device or if it's something that we want to continue to um, include as far as the modeling of lessons is concerned. But maybe it's not a big selling point when it comes to drawing in teachers to the program. As far as our scale up is concerned, um, just a scale up and some changes in what we are looking at. If we are going to have a sustainable program, whether it's something that we are doing or we're spinning off to others, the first thing that has to go is the week-long residential program because it's just incredibly expensive. So we are moving towards a blended learning approach for our next cohort where we are asking the teachers, we'll have less contact time with the teachers and we are asking them to do more work outside of the traditional workshop setting uh, where we've been starting to describe it as a small move or I don't know if a smook is a thing or not. Um, and what we are also doing is we will be developing um, from our first two cohorts a select number of teachers as, um, as master teachers who we will be training to, um, to run similar smaller scale workshops at a district level or a regional level in the out years. And so the first group of master teachers that we are developing, we are hoping will be available to help us with our year four cohort, which is a year and a half out there. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And a um, couple, a question maybe, short question. Um, that the question was, um, will going to a SMOOC jeopardize um, the community of learners? And that is a concern of ours. And um, that is something that we are we are hoping to see how things go as we go to that model. To be honest, we have not been overly successful right now in forming a community of learners outside of our actual sessions. And so we are looking for ways, and any ideas anybody has would be greatly accept, uh, appreciated. Um, we're looking for ways to really foster those out of session conversations. There was a um, comment this morning about the use of, um, of Facebook, and that really turns out not to necessarily have been the right thing. We do have a Google group. Um, that, that we are starting up, and I don't know if that's, you know, going to be viable or not.